What's up guys? How are you today? I'm happy you're here. My name is Chelsea Seaburn. Welcome to The Smart Student. So after teaching APA 7th edition for a couple years now, I know exactly what you guys struggle with. And so what I'm doing in this video is I have condensed all of this information, all of your guys' feedback into an action-packed tutorial, giving you the basic understanding of APA referencing. So this is no longer a struggle for you. Now, this video is timestamped, so feel free to jump ahead if you know what you're looking for. But for those of you that are new to academic writing, that you're just learning APA 7th edition for the first time, or maybe you've been trying to master it for who knows how long, and you still haven't gotten it down, let's start at the basics. All right, so why do we have to create reference list entries in the first place? Well, when you're writing an academic paper, aka a research-based paper, you're out there researching other ideas, information, things that other people came up with first. And in order to use those ideas in your writing, well, you have to credit where it came from. So that's what a reference list entry does, is it provides credit where credit's due. On your end, this is something you get graded for, therefore you want to do it correctly. So that's why we create references. Now let's get into the how. We're going to start with the two basic concepts you need to understand in order to reference anything out there, and I do mean anything. And then I have about five to six examples putting that in motion. So you should be crystal clear. By the way, I created this free PDF download of the information in this video. You can find it down in the description below, somewhere up here on the screen. I usually link it above. Sound good? Let's do this. Come on. Woohoo, here we are. All right, let's dive right in, starting with those two basic concepts that if you understand this, what you're looking at on the screen, you can cite any source. And quite frankly, that's not a lot to understand. So here we go. The two things that you need to understand are the four elements of an APA reference and then the two formatting patterns of those references. So let's start with the first portion, the four elements. In other words, these are the building blocks. When you want to cite a source, these are the four items you're looking for. What they are is the author, the date, the title, the source. So coming down here, this is what it looks like in a more formal setting. So when you type all of this out, this is just the basics of what it might look. And that is, this is how you're going to include the author by their last name, middle initial, first initial. Then you have the date of publication. Sometimes this is just the year. Maybe you have the day and the month. Maybe you have all three items. We'll get to this in the examples. And then by title, we mean title of the work. So what is the journal article called or the web page called or even the Facebook post? What's the title of it called? That's what the title of the work is referring to. And then finally, you have the source element. So starting with the source name, that's going to be the name of the website, the name of the journal that the journal article belongs to, the name of the book that you found the information in. And quite frankly, because most of our information is online, there's generally a second part to the source, which is going to be either a DOI number or a URL link. Now, if it's not an online, then you simply only need the name of the source. So when you're citing a source, these are the four items you're looking for. Now, this is a good time to note that sometimes the source might be missing some of these elements. So an author may not be listed or the date of publication may not be listed, for example. Please keep in mind that in order for a source to be a source, you have to have the source element because you need to be able to look it up. So for example, if you're trying to source information from an interview you did, but it's not recorded, it's not written anywhere, well, no one can look it up. Therefore, that's not gonna count as a citable source. If anything, that might be a personal communication. Quite frankly, a source can be missing all three of the first elements, but as long as you have the location of where you found that material, you can cite it in your paper. But all right, we got one basic concept down. Let's move on to the second one, and that is the two formatting patterns of APA reference. So what that means is that for the thousands of sources that you can be trying to cite, all of them will fall into one of these two categories when you're formatting them. And that is either with an italic title or with an italic source. The criteria for these is that for an italic title, it needs to be a work that stands alone. And for an italic source, it needs to be a work that is part of a greater whole. So now let's see what this actually looks like. 
using our template of the four elements, note how for works that stand alone, the title of the work is italicized, and for works that are part of a greater whole, the source name is italicized. And quite frankly, if you're wondering what the difference between standing alone and part of a greater whole is, well, you're not alone. It's very common, and this confuses college students, so this is how I like to simplify it. I want you to think of a journal versus a journal article. The journal itself is a standalone source because it doesn't belong in to anything else. However, the journal article, because it belongs to the journal, it's a work that's a part of a greater whole. There's actually a list here. This is in the APA manual. You can also find it in that PDF that you can download that I have made for you guys. And so let's zoom all the way out. Okay, so standalone. Think of a full book. Reference works such as encyclopedias, you have government reports, other types of reports, what they call grade literature, something like a brochure, a fact sheet, a press release, ethics codes, dissertation thesis papers. The good news is that if you'll know, most sources are considered standalone. Part of a greater whole, again, falls in line with that journal article mentality. Think of a magazine article, a newspaper, a blog post, an edited book chapter a TV series episode, podcast episodes. This is the difference when it comes to how you're gonna be formatting the source. So these are the two things. If you understand this, you can cite anything. But all right, now we're gonna take this information and get into the examples where we're gonna see this in action. Okay, these are the first two I wanna start with. And that's an example of a work that stands alone versus one that's part of a greater whole. And we're gonna zoom in here so you can see all the finer details. And what I really want you to do is pay attention to how the template translates into the actual reference. Because here's the thing, the template, this is the aim you're shooting for. However, when you're out there citing an actual source, you might be missing little pieces and there's gonna be different variations. And so I'm gonna do my best to explain why the reference is the way it is in regard to the template. All right, so here we have a standard web page with one author. As you can see, for an author element, what APA asks is that you include the author's last name, followed by a comma, their middle initial, a period, ending with their first initial, a period. Coming down here, as you can see, the middle name was not listed, therefore it's omitted from the author element. So for this example, that is considered a complete and correct author element. Finally, I want you to take note that there is a period after the final portion of the author element. Why is this important? It's because this is gonna be a common theme throughout all of the elements, and that is that to conclude an element, you want to include a period to signify the conclusion of that element. So as you can see here, all four of them can be easily identified if you simply find the periods. All right, next we have the date element, which quite frankly, the date element is always gonna be the day that this source became a citable source. So in other words, when was the book published? When was the webpage posted? When was the podcast episode posted? When was that piece of work officially made a citable source? Now, coming over here to our template, this again is the aim you're shooting for. So if all of this is present, this is what you're going to include. And that is the year followed by a comma, the month, day of publication. So coming down here, we had all of that available to us. We had 2018, a comma, January 2nd. If all that was listed on this webpage was the year, then our date element would simply look like that. But again, we had all of it available to us, so that's what we're going to include. Cool. Moving on to the third element, we have the title of the work. And remember, this is a work that stands alone, so we're gonna italicize the title to signify that. Here, this is the example I like to go with because we have a few good points for formatting here. I want you to take note that one, both portions of it is written in sentence case, meaning that the first letter is capitalized. Why is the first letter capitalized in this example? It's because it's broken up with a punctuation. We have the colon here. If there was no colon, then we would simply leave it like this, continuing with the sentence case formatting. But again, we have it there, so we're gonna leave it as is because that's the correct formatting for the title of the work in this case. 
All right, moving on to the source element, we have the website name. And then because this is an online source, we're gonna include the URL link. Now, this brings me to a good point. If the entire source element contains both of these, why is the period after the website name and not the URL? Well, the logic is twofold. One, if you include any punctuation, such as a period after a URL link or a DOI number, you're gonna break that link. So someone's not gonna be able to click on it and actually use it. The other reason is that a URL or DOI is optional. It's not always gonna be available to you. And so for a source to be correct, you simply need the name of the source, what it's called. And so we'll see that in other examples. Now, looking at the actual example, couple things I wanna note here. One, note how the symbol is used rather than the word and. The reason is because that's how it's presented on the website. You don't wanna change that so there's no confusion where the source came. Also, it's capitalized. Why? Because the name of the source is generally more formalized than the title. So things like the Washington Post or the New York Times or the name of a book, the name of a podcast. Generally, it's going to be capitalized. But as you already know, we have our period to close out the name of the source element here. And then we have our live URL link where I could click this and go find this actual source. Very cool. Now, let's take all of that understanding and let's move on to an example of a source that's part of a greater whole. Let's keep ourselves zoomed in actually. I'm just going to extend this so we can zoom in and see everything nice and neatly. Perfect. All right, as I said, my explanations are gonna get a little shorter as we go on. What I want you to pay attention to is that the formatting standards for the different variations remain relatively the same across all different sources. The biggest difference really is rather to italicize the title of the work or the title of the source. As you can see, the templates for both of these look the same. So diving into this actual example, starting with the author element, we can see that we have one author, the middle name was not available to us, so we omitted that from the source. And here we go, looks just like the one we did in the previous example. Moving on to the second element here, we have the date. Again, all three pieces were available to us, so we formatted it the same way we did with the other source. Now we have the slight variation in formatting. Because this is a magazine article, which belongs to an actual magazine, we're going to leave the title in basic font and italicize the title of the magazine. Aside from that, you're still gonna follow sentence case formatting for the title element. In this example, the title is all one phrase. There's no punctuation to break it up. So that's why the F in the first word is capitalized and nothing else. Now, coming over here, we have the title of the magazine, which is prevention, easy. We're going to italicize that. And then note how there is a URL link. That's because this is a source we found online. As you can see for this note, if it's a print source, you're gonna use the page numbers versus the URL. So let's say I did read this in a hard copy. We're gonna use a comma after the title of the magazine and then include the page range as such with the period following after the pages. Why is it okay to use a period after the page range and not the URL? Well, because a period after page ranges isn't going to break the integrity of the page ranges as it would the URL link. Kind of makes sense, doesn't it? But all right, now we're gonna move on to some variations of these other elements, starting with different variations of the author. So let me just scroll down here so you can see what I mean. Because the first thing I wanna talk about is when the author is a group author. What that means is that an actual person or people are not responsible for the source an organization is, maybe a government agency. It's an entity versus a living live person. So taking a look at the template, well, everything else looks exactly the same, except in the author element, we're gonna use the name of the group, in this case, an organization, Canadian Cancer Society, instead of a person. Something to note with group authors that's relatively common is that if the group name and the website are the same, then you don't need to include the name of the website in the source element. So in this case, Canadian Cancer Society is the organization responsible for this source. It's also the name of the website this article was found on. 
So APA asks that you don't include it twice because that's redundant. And with the source element, you're fine because you have the URL link where you can go find the source. Other than that, this is a standalone source. So we're going to italicize the title here and we're good to go. Now, the next author variation we're going to look at is when a source has two authors. And I've actually chosen a journal article for another reason in that journal articles, the source has just a few extra moving parts than other sources. So this one has two different variations we're gonna pay attention to. Starting with the template. This is your aim when you're citing a source that has two authors responsible for that piece of work. Simply put, you're gonna use the ampersand symbol to separate the two authors. Both of them, you're aiming for the same information, their last name, middle initial, first initial, if present. As you can see in the example, that's exactly what we have. We have Soto, comma, C, period, J, period, the ampersand sign, John, comma, O, period, P, period. Again, pretty simple stuff, but now, Let's talk about the variations of the rest of the elements that are specific to a journal article. First, looking at the date element. APA asks that you only include the year of publication when it comes to a journal article. Why? Well, because with the source, you're gonna be including a lot of other information that makes it very specific that they would rather you leave out the month and the day. So there's not as much information to where it's confusing. As you can see, we have a lot of other numbers and just stuff in this source in general. So to keep it nice and simple, they asked to only include the year of publication. In this example, our journal was published in 2017. And other than that, the rest of the formatting remains the same. Now, moving on to the title of the journal article. Well, we know this is a work that's part of a greater whole, therefore we're not going to italicize it and the rest of the formatting standards remain the same, meaning we're using sentence case, especially if there is a punctuation, we're going to continue sentence case again. So there's no variations in referencing the title of a journal article. It's next in the source element that we're gonna see these changes. The good news though, the first portion, the title of the journal remains the same. Keep it in italic fonts, it's what comes after that where there's just a few extra items you need to include. As you can see here, you need to include the volume number, the issue number, and the page range if available. So let's see what this looks like in translation. All right, title of the journal, we have it here, italic fonts, it's in capital case because the journal article is great. Now, because we're not finished with the source element, we're going to include a comma instead of a period. Next, we're going to include the numbers associated with the periodical. What does that mean? Periodical means it's posted periodically. There is more than one. In other words, there's a volume and an issue number that this source belongs to. We're gonna start with the volume number followed by the issue number. And in order to differentiate between the two, we're going to keep the volume number italicized. And then we're going to unitalicize our font and put the issue number in parentheses. So it's crystal clear which is which. In this example, we have a page range. So again, since we're not finished with the source element, we're gonna use a comma versus a period and we're going to include the page range. Very simple. Now that our source element, the first portion anyways, is complete, we will go ahead and include the period to close that. And then we now have our DOI number because that was an online version. And I do wanna point out something because I know that seems like a lot of information. It seems like a lot to remember. The good news is in journal articles, especially online journal articles, this information is typically grouped together. You're not gonna find the volume number up at the top right hand corner of one and the issue number down in the bottom. As you can see here, this one actually has the full reference list entry, which a lot do as well. But I just wanna point out the source portion typically it's always included together. And if it's not formatted correctly, it's still in that order. They're never gonna change that order, so you're always aware which is which. And just to reiterate one more time, if we didn't have a page range available to us, then you don't need to include it. I would include a period after the issue number in this case, followed by the DOI number. But we're gonna put this back to how we found it, and we're gonna continue on our quest with the author variations. There's two more scenarios in specific that we're gonna cover, and we're gonna keep with journal articles because they tend to have a lot of authors. The first one, 
is what to do when a source has three or more authors and three or more meaning up to the first 19. So this stands true whether you have three, five, 18. Okay, simply put, all of the authors leading up to the last two are gonna be separated by a comma and then the last two are gonna use that ampersand symbol once more signifying that you've reached the last two. Something I'd like to note when you have multiple authors is the order. Why are they listed the way they are? Well, you're going to list them by contribution to the piece of work. So in other words, the first author listed will always be the one who put in the most work, followed by the second, the third, going down the list until you get to the author that contributed the least amount of work. Looking at our example, we can see our authors using this template. We have, I believe, seven in this example, but regardless, all of the authors are separated by a comma until you get to the last two where you'll find the ampersand. Since the rest of this source follows the exact same formatting we just covered in the previous example, I'm not gonna cover the rest of the elements here. Instead, let's, let's focus on what to do if you have 20 or more authors, because again, this does happen and you'll find it mostly with journal articles where lots of people can be contributing to that journal. If you're faced with this situation, what APA would like you to do is include the first 19 authors as you would, followed by an ellipsis, which is three periods. Then you're gonna skip the rest of the authors until you get to the last and include the last one. So let's say this had 25. Well, I would include the first 19 and then I'm going to include the 25th. This situation is definitely on the rare side, but just know this, you're never going to type out more than 20 authors, even if you have more available to you. Woo, that was a lot of information. Actually, it wasn't that bad. I hope you feel the same way. But by the way, if you enjoyed the lesson today and how it was structured, the color coordination, the teaching style, I now have an APA Made Easy student guidebook that's about 130 pages long where I've taken APA 7th edition and I've broken it down lesson by lesson under my teaching style because you guys keep telling me it works. If you want to learn how you can get your hands on your own copy of the APA Made Easy student guidebook, there's a link down below to an information page. It will tell you exactly what's included lots of stuff in there don't have enough time to go over it right now but with that i think i've taken enough time of yours actually so i'm just gonna say bye and i will see you in the next video